Well, our next panel is Reinventing National Security in the Era of COVID-19, and we have two amazing panelists who just, uh, to help us think through that. Uh, Undersecretary Flournoy is, of course, uh, former Undersecretary of, uh, of Defense for Policy. She was also the uh, manager, managing partner and founder of Sex Advisors. She's also the former CEO of CNAS. Uh, and we also have General Joseph Intel, who ran Central Command of the Political Operations Command, and now is the CEO of uh, Business Executives for National Security. So let me start with just a sort of broad question for both of you, which is almost 200,000 Americans have died, which is more than the combined total of Americans who died in every war. Korean War, uh, we had a million people die, die around the world. Obviously, we're sort of in the second or third innings of a fairly long game here. <clears throat> What do we need to think, how do we need to reconceptualize national security, um, both in terms of uh, maybe the conceptualization, but also money, because at the end of the day, money is what what, what drives, <laughs> where you put your money is where you're putting your your bets in a sense, and where we have a $700 billion plus defense budget versus, you know, CDC getting kind of uh, budget cuts, um, you know, do we need to kind of rethink about how we're defining the security and how we're spending money on it? Michelle. Thanks, Peter, and thanks for joining this conversation. You know, I think it's impossible to imagine that after a pandemic like this, with nearly 200,000 Americans dying from this, that we wouldn't have a broader notion of national security that would include our preparedness to deal with transnational threats, not just nation state threats like a rising China or hostile Russia, or you know, Iran and, and, and North Korea pursuing nuclear weapons, but um, transnational threats like pandemics, like climate change, like non Um And I think if you take that broader definition of national security, uh, you do have to look at a wider toolbox. And it, it, it raises the question of whether we need to rebalance that toolbox somewhat. I mean, you can see I've spent my whole career in defense bullish on having a strong military that's capable of deterring and preventing conflict. But I also want to really have a state to lead the U.S. with diplomacy and a really robust the idea that can go out and do humanitarian and development work um, and, and really robust you know, other civilian instruments. But I think in the wake of the pandemic, that should also include public health instruments and our support for the WHO and our ability to take more of a leadership role than we have this time in really leading the world uh, and uh, coalitions of not like-minded states in pandemic response, making sure we do better, much, much, much better next time. General Votel. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's great to be with you and, and Michelle. So, you know, as, as, uh, as uh, Michelle mentioned here, you know, I, I think first and foremost, from a national security standpoint, this is exposed some of our own vulnerabilities uh, that have to be addressed have to be addressed whether it's our supply chain vulnerabilities or ability to have to produce and stockpile the right materials to uh, uh, to have on hand or whether it's our overall uh, response mechanism that we have for uh, for national emergencies and again I think everyone can appreciate that the pandemic this national emergency is is different than a hurricane it's different than an earthquake it's different than something is localized. This one is sustained and it is affecting all of us. So we need to make sure that we have a uh, response architecture uh, in place to uh, to address that. Um, and that, that's kind of so that's kind of on the internal <clears throat> uh, standpoint. You know, look, looking externally, uh, I think COVID and the pandemic adds another layer of environmental complexity to the areas in, in which we operate. It's going to be a persistent factor. I mean, I think we've already heard service chiefs and others talk about uh, talk about this aspect, the fact that they will have to continue to operate in an environment that is characterized by a persistent uh, a persistent virus. Uh, so it's going to have some impacts on us and how we operate with our partners. There's 
there's no doubt there's financial uh, impact to this uh, and, uh, you know, to address some of the internal things uh, and making and, and addressing our preparedness there, we're going to have to make investments in that particular area. And that will have to come with some offsets, I, I would imagine. And that may include the, the Department of Defense. Uh, I, I certainly hope that any of those decisions will be made very carefully and deliberately uh, with looking, uh, looking, looking at the future impacts. But I do think this uh, does change our environment, uh, our, our security environment uh, for those reasons and the fact that it's exacerbated our relationship with China uh, at, the, at, a, at an important juncture. So I, I think there's no doubt it's, it's we're going to have to reconceptualize how we look at national security in this environment. Related to that, um, we're in a kind of unusual era of civil military relations where you, General Vertel, for instance, have publicly criticized the president for withdrawing troops from Syria. Uh, you've also made some sort of more general statements about kind of upholding the Constitution. Uh, and obviously, you're not alone. A lot of uh, three-star and four-star retired, and even some of the active duty have made statements that are, are either uh, directly criticize the president or at least obliquely uh, say that he's getting something wrong. So, I mean, there's been a, it's not a, pol it's, it's not a law, it's a, it's a policy that the senior military retired so or should sort of stay out of politics. Are we creating some kind of bad precedence in a sense, or is it, or is the time uh, that we're in necessarily that you have to make these kind of mistakes? So when I say you, I mean I, I'm talking about there are dozens of uh, retired three stars and four stars who've made various kinds of statements in the recent years. Well, yeah, I think it's a I think it's a very fair and good question. I, first off, I don't think there's a rupture in civilian military relationships. Uh, I do think that the uh, the current the current environment of polarity, the lack of belief and understanding and support for uh, the institutions which have under undergirded our democracy for a long time, uh, have have perhaps brought this to the forefront and, and and put it in in some level of tension. But I don't think there's a rupture in place and. Uh, and uh, I, I certainly have have written on topics that were, uh, were that I thought were important to, to me. I think uh, everybody has to um, has to engage for their own uh, purposes, and I won't try to uh, divine the reasons why everybody did. I, I know why I did. Um, it was principally because I, I I thought I could play a role in informing, educating, um, and uh, and helping with the understanding on on complex topics, and uh, and. Why we have to? Why we ought to have, have some, uh, uh, public discourse about uh, about some of these things and and, uh, and trying to inform the whole public? And I I try to do that in a way that uh, doesn't. Uh, uh, personally attack anybody, tries not to make it harder for people in uniform, doesn't critique those who are who are charged with carrying out the, the missions on the ground, for which I no longer have responsibility. So I do think there's a, I do think there's a role. I think it has to be very deliberate. I think you have to have your own rules in place for how you do it. Secretary, how do you come down on that? Uh, you know, if, if it's a Biden administration um, or either now or, or a Kamala Harris administration down the road and senior officers come out in some way publicly critiquing the acts of that administration. Uh, hasn't the kind of precedent been set in perhaps a, a way that uh, Democrats might like uh, in some future where um, senior retired are taking, are critiquing what, what that administration is doing? Well, I start from the premise that it's very important to our democracy to have a military that uh, is an a largely apolitical institution. And so I, I don't think there's been a rupture, but I do think there, there, the relationship is not in a healthy place and it needs to be reset based on first principles. I think we've had a president who has tried to be more political in his use of the military, whether it you know, using the military um, in a sort of law enforcement role in Lafayette Park in, in ways that many felt were potentially violating First Amendment rights, constitutional rights of Americans who were protesting, you know, lining up military officers, particularly general officers, for photo ops for his political purposes, intervening in the military justice system to overturn uh, rulings and convictions uh, for his political purposes. I mean, so there's there's a lot of fraying of the fabric here that I think does need to be 
repaired. Um, but I think you have to go back to first principles. You know, I, I think that every, I, I can't speak as a military officer, but I, I have many colleagues and friends who've been in this position where they really do believe in the apolitical nature of the institution and the importance of that. And yet there, for every individual, there may become a time where they feel morally compelled to speak up because they are so concerned about the actions being taken. And I think it's a very, very individual choice. My view is, you know, we need to keep the military apolitical, but we also need a leadership climate where people who have the basis for, for offering really important dissent have a chance to, you know, hopefully internally, internal to the government, you know, an environment where dissent is heard, it's valued, it's respected, and it's taken into account in decision making. When you close that off, you're going to get a lot more squirting out into the public domain in, in other ways when people feel they morally have to speak up and they're not being heard internally. Um, General Votel, um, you had criticized the withdrawals from Syria. Obviously, the president has announced a fairly substantial drawdown from it was around 14,000 uh, down to 4,000 in Afghanistan. We had similar drawdowns in Iraq. Um, I mean, are these drawdowns wise and are they somewhat reminiscent, uh, Secretary Flournoy, of decisions that the, the Obama administration made at the end of the second term, towards the end of the second term of the Obama administration in Afghanistan and the end of 2011 and during the Obama administration in Iraq? So uh, maybe start with you, Jennifer Vitale, and then Secretary Flournoy. Sure. So, you know, you know, I think what you've heard over over a long period of time, certainly, uh, you know, I, I mentioned this when I was in uniform serving that, uh, you know, reductions in force and change in force posture and locations ought to be ought to be driven by the conditions on the ground and those conditions that are contributing to the strategic objectives that uh, that uh, that we are trying to trying to achieve. Um, and so, you know, whether these are wise at this particular time, I'm not sure I can make the decision on that because I'm not the guy that is looking at the at the specific conditions on the ground uh, that inform that but I think it is, it is vitally important uh, that we that we understand that uh, in the situation of Afghanistan here where we're where we're now engaged in uh, in negotiations between the Taliban and the government of, of Afghanistan I think uh, presence and capability of, by United States forces on the ground is an important aspect uh, to back it up and to support that uh, Looking at uh, looking at uh, Iraq, I mean, the the majority of the of the of the campaign to uh, certainly to liberate the caliphate has has been complete, and uh, we're you know we are continuing to work with our Iraqi partners in uh, in addressing the the remnant threats of ISIS that remain in the area. And uh, again, I think we have to always look at what uh, what uh, what the force posture is and what's needed to do that. But it has to be driven by by the conditions that are trying to be created to support uh, the objectives that we have on the ground. So um, that will be the determination of, uh, of whether, we, uh, whether we have made a wise choice or not. And in this particular area, I think we've seen, in the, we've seen indications in the past that when we, you know, when we withdraw quickly, when we draw completely uh, without, uh, without, a, without a, a plan to, to, to sustain things, then, then we have a tendency to, to run into problems. Um, so we have to be very, very deliberate. Michelle? Yes, I would, I would just add, um, I agree that I think where you get into trouble is precipitous unilateral withdrawals without consultation, without um, assessment of the associated risks and some risk mitigation planning. Um, I think that's what we saw in Syria, and that's why you got such a strong response from people, um, especially because, you know, when you fight, when, when you have allies that are literally fighting and dying alongside you in the, in the battlefield, you know, surprising, you know, kind of dumping them without notice, without consultation, without a plan is not only something that's very damaging to that alliance, but it's damaging to every alliance. It makes every ally who relies on the United States question whether they can rely on the United States. And that's really potentially very damaging to our credibility. You know, I think in Iraq at this point, you know, um, I, I, again, I like General Votel, I'm out of government. I haven't seen the analysis, but 
It seems to me that if we're consulting closely with our Iraqi partners and the coalition, that it's possible to manage some degree of drawdown while supporting the security assistance and cooperation mission of continuing to advise, assist, train, equip the Iraqi forces there. And, um, you know, that seems like a reasonable effort to me. On the Afghan, on the Afghan side, I think that you know, we have a similar goal in mind to transition to a long, you know, to a security cooperation assistance kind of model. But there, I think we're at a more delicate moment. Um, I, you know, General Votel noted the, the negotiations. This is the first time there's really been a sit down between the Taliban and the Afghan government and broader Afghan society. We need to make sure to support this and give it a chance to work. And I think if the U.S. were to withdraw unilaterally or precipitously, we could actually undercut the negotiations and particularly the uh, leverage of the Afghan government and Afghan civil society at the table. So I think we have to be very careful. We have to be conditions based and we have to be mindful of how our troop posture interplays with uh, the dynamics and potential success of the negotiations. Well, on, on the negotiations, I mean, to, to both of you, starting with General Votel, of course, had responsibility as a commander for Central Command for Afghanistan. Um, you know, is it uh, how much faith do you put in the Taliban's kind of the, the view that they will disassociate themselves with terrorist organizations of which there are supposedly 20 in the Afghan region, uh, that they really will have a different policy on women, uh, that they really have a plan other than just simply to take over the, as much of the country as possible? Do you think that, uh, and is there other splits that, that exist between the people negotiating in Doha and people on the ground, and that ultimately those splits may, you know, kind of really impact any kind of potential deal? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have, I don't hold any illusions that uh, that uh, that this is going to be an easy process, and there won't be uh, there won't be some backtracking, and there won't be uh, disappointments along the way. I mean, I, I think this whole process that we've watched play out, really for the last uh, last several years now, since the Trump, you know, since President Trump announced his <clears throat> his strategy and his focus on bringing this to uh, to reconciliation between the Taliban and uh, and the government of Afghanistan. Afghanistan. And so we've seen how, how hard this is this has been to get to this particular point. Um, and uh, but 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 we're here and uh, and along the way that has taken discussions and it's taken some level of accommodation uh, on both sides to get to this particular point. Um, you know, with regard to the Taliban, I mean, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, the, the they have not always been trustworthy in terms of the things that they have done. And we've seen them, we have seen them use their own uh, uh, military capability to uh, ratchet up pressure on the uh, Afghan government when things weren't going well in the, in the you know, in the pre-discussions of this. So, uh, you know, I expect that some level of that will, will continue throughout this. This is going to continue to be a very, very hard process as, as we work through this. But they're, they're, they're at the table and, uh, and they're, and they're, are now talking and this is uh, this is a, a move in the right direction and as Michelle said this is this is why it is so important at this point for us to stay engaged in this process this has been the object of what we've been what we've been focused on for the last couple of years now we need to uh, to to stay with it and uh, and help help shepherd it along with our allies to the uh, through the through the process as difficult it is, is going to as it is going to be and we need to be prepared to respond to pressure with pressure uh, on this. And we do that by maintaining capabilities and our own uh, forces on the ground, I think. Yeah, I would just add, I think, um, I think both sides have realized that they cannot fully achieve their objectives on the battlefield. And I think that's one of the primary reasons why they're both at the table. Um, I think both understand that if the talks break down, the most likely, um, and and if they, they they lost the support of the international community, it's sort of condemning themselves and their country to years more of civil war. So I think even the Taliban understands that the only way Afghanistan goes forward is with the support of the international community, is including investment and development support. And so you know that argues for some kind of compromise. Now, um, you know, whether whether they can get there, I don't know. My own view is if you look at historical cases, 
you got to give this some time. This is really complex. This is not going to happen in a week or, or maybe even a year. And I just hope that the international community has the staying power is to, to hang in there, to use the leverage we have, as General uh, mentioned, but to, to not get frustrated in a month's time and say, forget it, we're done. Because then I think we, we would make, uh, you know, it would be an unfortunate set of decisions and outcomes that would follow from that. Secretary so Fulman, when historians write the, the history of the Trump sort of national security foreign policy, will they say that Trump team largely got off uh, the kind of China threat? Um, they kind of scoped it appropriately, even if the tactics weren't always correct? I think there's actually now a fair amount of bipartisan consensus on the nature of the challenge with China, that this is a multidimensional competition, economic, technological, security, even ideological or political. So um, I think there's more consensus about the nature of the problem than there is about the strategy that's been used to handle it. I think the critique of the Trump administration will be it's been too tactical, hasn't really had a strategy. It's been very transactional and very focused, particularly on trade and tariffs and, and that line of action. Um, and more recently, it started to focus on the whole question of technology competition and potential for decoupling. But there really hasn't been a broader strategy. This is the first administration that hasn't had a strategic dialogue with China ever since Nixon. We've had a strategic dialogue that dealt with everything from security issues to economic issues to, frankly, areas of cooperation. You know, there is a cooperative agenda that needs to be worked with China, whether it's pandemics or climate, nonproliferation, North Korea. I mean, so this is a, a relationship that has to be, you have to both deal with the fundamental competition, but also try to prevent that from becoming conflict as you also try to work on cooperative areas. That's a very nuanced, approach that has to require some pretty strategic thinking. And I think that's been lacking. The other thing I'll note is, I have, in my experience, the best way to influence Chinese behavior is with by with some of our allies. When we show up as 20 like-minded states to put, push back on some bad Chinese behavior, whether it's in the South China Sea or in the trades there, we tend to get results. When the U.S. does it unilaterally, we're much less likely to be affected. So I think the, they, you know, there's a missing piece of really working the allied dimension of our approach going forward. Well, just a quick follow up on that. The Trans-Pacific Partnership was something that the Trump administration pulled out five days into the administration. And it, uh, seemingly because they misunderstood, uh, Trump may have personally misunderstood the, what it was supposed to do. So in a Biden administration, would that be revived? I can't speak for a Biden administration, um, but I do think that it, I agree it was a mistake not to sign on to the treaty framework we worked so hard to uh, negotiate, that it created the per percent perception of the U.S. is not really pivoting to Asia. We're not really going to show up in the way that our allies and partners hoped we would. I do hope in a new administration that there will be consideration given to is that a framework the U.S. could join? Is there a way to build on that framework and, and, and couple it with some investment in recalibration of our own workforce and economy as we try to rebuild that, you know, to actually get us to the point where we could be part of the, the, that framework? Uh, I think that would be not only in our economic issues interests, but also in our strategic interests. Um. We've we've seen now this rapprochement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, uh, countries you know well from your military experience. I mean, is this a big deal, a small deal, a medium deal? Um, obviously, Egypt and Israel fought two pretty powerful wars when they made peace in, in between Amr Sadat and, and Jimmy Carter and, and, and Begin. Um, where would you score this? Uh, uh, tr driver for change in the region. I, I think it is important. Maybe it sits somewhere between medium and and, uh, and really uh, really high uh, in terms of. This. I mean, these were countries that were in conflict, uh, but they were. I think the uh, the idea of 
Israel and Arab countries normalizing relationships, I think, is a is a is an opportunity for the region. Uh, and uh, and regardless of whether they've had, you know had some level of contact going on for a number of years, to do it public, I think, is a is a is a is a is a, is a provides us a good opportunity and certainly provides a good optic for uh, more stability in, in the region, which I think is an important aspect. Uh, for those that have uh, that have spent a lot of time in the region, we've seen the benefit of, uh, of a relationship between Israel and Jordan, between Israel and Egypt. Uh, that, has, that has helped stabilize things. It has uh, uh, made things uh, better in the region. And so I think there's some hope for this. I think the challenge in and of itself uh, I think it's an achievement, but I think the more important aspect is how do we now use this uh, to uh, to re to relook at what our strategy for the uh, for the region is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pressure campaign on Iran, and then uh, of course the the long-term uh, peace plan for the Palestinians. Uh, I think we have to look at how this can potentially contribute to moving forward on. A objectives in the, in the region. And so that to me will be the real, the real opportunity here is if we can leverage this to, to, to move forward in a more strategic manner on the, on the broader issues of the, of the, of the region that are of some concern to us and to people in the region and others around the world. Switching gears a little bit, Secretary Flournoy, your question I will not ask General Votel directly. Uh, how would you assess President Trump as commander in chief? Um, frankly, I do not think that he has the attributes necessary for the job. Um, you know, being able to, you know, work in a couple of different administrations and observe others from the outside. I think a commander in chief has first and foremost an appreciation for the Constitution and the, the div division of labor in our divided government and his authorities versus those of Congress and others. Um, he has an appreciation for the importance of keeping the military out of politics uh, and not misusing them as a political tool. Uh, he has a, an appreciation for the weight of the decisions that uh, should be, you know, when decisions sending Americans, sons and daughters into harm's way are made, the weight of those decisions, the need to listen, the need to really grapple with the material, to understand the risks, to ask yourself, would I be willing to send my own son or daughter? And if not, then what business do I have sending someone else's? You know, the, the uh, willingness to hear dissent, to make sure that you really take, look at things from all different angles and you can use that dissent even if you don't agree with it, to be more aware of the risks and, 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 and have an opportunity to mitigate some of those risks. So temperamentally, um, intellectually, um, and, and just in the way that he has operated, he's a very transactional tactical leader um, who I don't, I think that probably one of his weakest areas of job performance has been in the commander in chief role. Um, and for me, this should be a litmus test for Americans when they go to the polls. You got to have someone that you believe that first and first job number one is protecting the security of this country. And we are in a very challenging period. So I would hope, I hope that's high on everybody's list as they evaluate their choices. Um, I'm going to move a little bit to some of the questions that are coming. Uh, I'll just General Votel, did you have something you wanted to say? No, no, I'm good. Um, so a question from a leading Pakistani uh, journalist, Imtiaz Ghul, which is a, a good question. I would also relate to something that General Votel just mentioned, which is, it, it, let's say President Trump does lose the election. What happens to the Taliban peace process? And related to the Iran uh, agreement and, and pressure campaign that General Votel mentioned, I mean, uh, part of you know, the nature of our business, of our, uh, of our electoral process is that you can have these changes every four years. And unless you have uh, kind of ratified by the Senate uh, treaties, uh, things can change, whether it's the Paris Climate Agreement or the Iran nuclear agreement. And, and you know, that puts our allies and, and our enemies, I think, in a, it's hard for, to predict what we're going to do. It's, and, uh, you know, not through anybody's particular fault, but just for the nature of the system. So starting with the Taliban peace agreement, uh, I mean, obviously, neither of you are involved in those negotiations right now. But 
Any thoughts about, you know, what a future, if, if you know, other administrations will continue this as a, as a kind of bipartisan cons consensus around these negotiations? I'll start with you, Secretary Flournoy. Yeah, my, my sense is that there is a very good degree, solid degree of bipartisan consensus supporting giving this a try, you know, giving the negotiations a chance to be successful. You know, we are we are out of good options here. Um, and this has been a very long and costly and painful war. Um, so I think you find, you know, again, I can't speak for a future administration, but I would be surprised if there wasn't wholehearted support on for the negotiations and frankly, maybe even a doubling down in terms of putting more US diplomatic effort and capital into trying to move them forward, to bring the region together to support um, the uh, uh, the negotiations to to reduce the risk of spoiler activity on the margins. So I, I can't imagine, you know, either administration walking from it. Well, I can I can't imagine <laughs> a new administration walking away from it. I, I, I do worry that President Trump, you know, he's made it very clear that he he wants to bring troops home from a lot of places. I do worry that he'll wake up one morning and say, I'm done with it, we're coming home, damn the consequences. I, 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 I would just add from my perspective as a military person, I think, I think that there is, a, there is an importance in some continuity in our strategic approaches. I mean, you look at the Cold War, for example, I mean, how many administrations that took place over the course and we were able to, while we changed some tactics along the way, uh, strategically, we stayed pretty predictable in terms of that. And I think the strategic predictability is a, is a benefit for us, particularly with our allies and partners who are joining us in these things. And so, you know, some of the tactics and other things uh, certainly should change, and I'm not saying there shouldn't be changes in strategy, but I think they do have to be considered. I think we have to we have to look at the impacts of that. I, I'm, I would be very hopeful uh, that we would kind of continue to stay the course with, now that we've put all the work into getting the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan to the to the table. Question uh, uh, from Stephen Shapiro, which is. Uh, you know, what is the role, the proper role for the intelligence agencies? The, the, the question or asks uh, mentions that the DIA, General Ashley, apparently sort of predicted some of the COVID um, issues uh, early early on or, or said that they would be, uh, you know, large scale consequence. So what is the proper role of the intelligence community in providing strategic warning about pandemics, uh, starting with you, Secretary Flormo? I, I think the intelligence community has a very role to play, um, uh, but I think the, the primary warning tends to come from our public health um, infrastructure and, uh, and, 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 and experts. Um, and I think, you know, in, the, in, the, in comparing notes in organizations like the WHO, I mean, I'd be the first person to say that there's, the World Health Organization needs some strengthening and reform. But the way to get that to that outcome is not to abandon it in the middle of a pandemic, but to you know, to reinvest in it to to get it to to a better level of performance. Um, I think the U.S. missed an opportunity to play a leadership role, whether it was leveraging the WHO or the G20 or and so forth, to coordinate a much more coherent early response that might have made a difference in terms of saving lives around the world and certainly saving lives here here at home. So I do think the intelligence community has a role to play, um, but I also think that has to be paired with uh, the public health warning system, which is really kind of the front line of defense. General Votel, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, so, so um, I, you know, I agree with Michelle. I think that's exactly right. I think the, the intelligence community can play a, a very strong supporting role for for all members of the interagency here and uh, in providing them the, the necessary background information and other things that they need to make judgments and turn that into information for the uh, for the public to understand what is happening. I, I don't think the, the intelligence community can do a better job of warning everybody in terms of this, uh, but, I, but I do think they have a role to play in, in supporting the, uh, the broader, broader agency on, on issues like this. 
To both of you, uh, you know, General Vicks, you spent your life with the U.S. military and Secretary Flournoy uh, working at the Pentagon and your families, uh, you know, volunteered uh, to be part of the U.S. military. Um, um, the U.S. military, by and large, is a pretty well integrated organization and historically has been a kind of integrating factor in American life. But at the three or four star level, it's overwhelmingly white and male. Um, you know, what, how, let me, let me start with you, Secretary Flournoy. Um, how, how do you um, kind of change that? That's not obviously something you can dip your, you know, turn, change overnight, but how do you change the culture, make it easier for uh, people of color uh, to get up into the, the, the three or four star uh, ranks? Well, I do think, I think you need to really assess the entire pipeline from initial recruiting and accession through, you know, selecting your specialty, through promotion paths, through um, all the way on, on up. I think um, while the military has uh, gotten better in the recruiting of a more diverse uh, force, um, as you said, as you as people get promoted up into higher higher echelons, that diversity tends to diminish. Um, some of that is is a cult cultures where uh, people of color get sort of encouraged to route into certain specialties that may not be combat arms, that may not be as competitive when it comes to promotion. Some of it may be internal bias. You know, right like now when you get a promotion folder, there's a photo of the person. And whether you're conscious or not, you know, we're all guilty sometimes of the mini-made culture of, you know, does that person remind me of myself and therefore I'm more inclined to support them. Um, so there's just, a, I think you really have to assess this current system's soup to nuts and then really sustain leadership focus on uh, changing, you know, removing the obstacles um, and keeping leadership attention on this. It needs, you know, the creation of an inclusive culture, a diverse team and inclusive culture needs to be at the very top of, of, of our leadership criteria, for our evaluation criteria. If you have leaders who are not doing that, um, that's a problem and they, that should factor into their promotion. And I would include in this the whole question of the unequal treatment of people by gender or sexual assault and, and harassment problems. I mean, this is a leadership issue, first and foremost. It's a culture issue. Um, but I, my hope is that at this moment in time, the department will finally really do kind of an end to end assessment of all of the, the, the challenges and roadblocks and really make a concerted effort to go after these in a very it, That could be transformative, not only to the, to the complexion of the military, to, to look like the population it serves but also to the performance. We all know that the more diverse a team is, the better the organization perform, performs. Harvard Business Review has countless articles documenting this in terms of company bottom line. So this is something that, that we need to do because it's but also because we'll have a better military as well. General Votel, you commanded four, uh, two four-star commands. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I, I think Michelle has, has, has hit on the key points here. Just to, to reinforce that, you know, if you look at it, and I'll speak about the service that I came from, the Army. Uh, you know, by the time an officer is selected for uh, for Brigadier General, they have they have served anywhere from uh, 24 to 26 years. So that that right there highlights the importance of getting in the process early and having a, uh, a development process and a, and a talent management process that that ensures that uh, that we are that we are addressing all of the of the diversity aspects that we require uh, in our in our in our leadership in our military forces and then you just think about a you know a three or four star back to your question now you're talking 30 to 34 years so it has to start early I'm, I'm really proud for uh, of the things that the army has started to do. I, I won't, I, I'm not meaning to besmirch the other services. I'm sure they're doing other things. I know the most about that. But there's been a very deliberate effort to try to get into the process early and start developing, uh, developing women, developing uh, 
people of color uh, to give them uh, greater opportunities. You know, the decision made back in 2016 to open up all specialties, all combat specialties to uh, to women was an important was an important step in moving towards this. But it's going to take time. When you think that it takes about 16 years to produce a, a battalion commander, that means around 2030, 2032, you'll be you you will see people you will hopefully see females that will be in positions where they will be battalion commanders in combat organizations. So it takes time. We have to have to dedicate it to it. What I can tell you is this, from my own experience, five years as a as a four star officer and having had the opportunity to to sit in many of the discussions that we had as a, uh, with the army leadership here on this is this is this topic is first and foremost of the things we're talking about. Uh, the, 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 the diversity aspect of it and making sure whether it's gender or color or whatever it happens to be uh, making sure that that was a part of the discussion as we looked at uh, growing the ship of the of the service this is a this is, is important and it's it's got to start early and it's got to be consistent across this and you've got to have leaders that that support this the whole way and and, uh, and that's absolutely essential to it okay one other question for our audience from the audience and this I think will probably be our final question. Is it best to modernize traditional weaponry or to focus on developing new technology uh, in the coming years? And, and how do we spark innovation that isn't commercially available to, to our adversaries? Maybe start with Secretary Flournoy. So I actually think the answer is hybrid of the two choices, meaning no matter what we do, we will likely end up with a, a baseline force that is comprised of a lot of legacy systems that will have already been purchased or are being purchased and will last for 30, 40 years. The name of the game is the, the deciding, finding those cutting edge, often commercially developed, sometimes developed by the primes, defense primes, but finding ways to take the new cutting edge take capabilities, whether they're AI enabled, whether they're unmanned systems that can be teamed with human being, human decision makers, whether it's new secure kinds of networks, uh, C4SR networks that can operate even in a very contested environment, whether it's hypersonic, you know, all these different kinds of things. The question is, how do you integrate those kinds of capabilities at scale with the force that you're gonna have? And not just by the, by the stuff, but allow those new capabilities to change how you actually deter and fight to change your concepts of operations, to change, to give you new advantages over your competitors. To me, it's really bringing those things together. And the hard choices are the trade-offs between in, investing in greater numbers of legacy systems versus taking some of that money to accelerate the development and adoption of these fewer capabilities at scale. But it's really the marriage of the two together and uh, the development of new of operation that's going to give us the edge in the future. I, I would agree with Michelle that I, I, that I think this probably is going to be a hybrid approach. But the thing I would uh, emphasize to you in, in, from my experience and what I've seen in terms of innovation is the, 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 the closer we can get uh, the users and the employers of the capabilities we're building to those that are developing, uh, the better we will be. And so it, it isn't, uh, it's, it's a function of deciding what, what new we're going to build and what we're going to, what we're going to continue to keep as, uh, as, as necessary legacy systems, but it's also about making sure we have the processes that really leverage uh, the innovative creativity of our of our people. Uh, and we have a proliferation of organizations out there that are doing that right now. DUIX, uh, you have Softworks, you have AFWorks, you have Naval X, you have Army Features Command, and, and I'm sure a variety of others out there that, that are that are that are really doing good and innovative work uh, to try to bring the best capabilities forward that we need uh, for the future, but we, we've really got to continue. We've got to look at all of that. And we've got to make sure that it makes sense in terms of the overall approach that we're taking to, to buying things. It's, it's, great to, it's great to have innovation, but if you don't have the system uh, that can bring that in, 
bring that into being and make it reality, then I then I think we we will have we will continue to have a problem. We'll continue to rely on legacy systems that cost a lot and won't be won't be the necessary things that we need when the when the next adversary uh, appears on our doorstep. Well, very much, General Votal and Secretary Flournoy. We know you're very busy. Um, thank you very much, both of you, for your um, insights today.